much. How does this work? We comprehend that land acknowledgements are a small but very important step towards ensuring a culture of respect, truth, and accountability in our community. It is imperative that these words develop into action as a sign of demonstrating our respect. We are residing on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Massachusetts people whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Massachusetts elders past and present. We acknowledge the truth of violence per perpetrated in the name of this country and made a, make a commitment to uh, uncovering that truth. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Eliana Ulloa, and I am the president of the Emerson College Skin Tones. <laughs> On behalf of Emerson College's Office of Intercultural Student Affairs, the Social Justice Centers, uh, Flawless Brown Artist Collective for Self-Identifying Women of Color, and Arts Emerson, I would like to welcome you to the live taping of Adrian Marie Brown's and Autumn Brown's uh, How to Survive the End of the World podcast featuring special guest Toshi Regan. Yeah. <laughs> We are excited to be joined today by three special guests. Adrienne Marie Brown is the author of Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good, and Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds. Yeah. <laughs> she is a writer, a social justice facilitator, pleasure activist, healer, and doula living in Detroit. <laughs> Autumn Brown is a mother, organizer, theologian, artist, and facilitator. Autumn brings over 10 years of experience facilitating organizational and strategic development with community-based and movement organizations and training organizers in consensus process facil facilitation and racial justice. And last but not least, we have the incomparable singer, songwriter, and musician Toshi Reagan, who has been a mainstay in the entertainment and music industry for more than 30 years. Toshi is considered a one-woman celebration of all that's dynamic, progressive, and uplifting in American music. <laughs> Regan's mu musical adaptation uh, with her mother, Bernice Johnson Regan, of the sci-fi Afrofuturist mas masterpiece, Octavia E. Butler's Parable of the Sower, brings together over 30 original music musical anthems and requiems drawn from 200 years of black music. Immediately following the podcast, there will be a reception with Adrian, Autumn, and Toshi that is open to all in the Lion's Den, where we hope you'll join us. The Lion's Den is located around the corner from here at 25 Boylston Place. And before we get the podcast underway, I'd like to invite David Dower, Artistic Director for Arts Emerson, to the stage to share some information for you. Hey. Good evening. So uh, first of all, I just want to welcome Eliana, and thank you, Eliana, for, uh, for jumping in. Right before the house opened, the MC fell ill, and uh, Eliana agreed to take it over. So thank you for <laughs> She's just seeing this all for the first time, so thank you so much for that. So I am David Dower, and I'm the Artistic Director of Arts Emerson and Vice President for Office of the Arts. And on behalf of the uh, President's Council and uh, Lee Pelton, our President, uh, and also Arts Emerson and all of uh, our uh, friends and family in, in that community, it's a, just a delight to be able to welcome you and to be able to welcome these incredible guests tonight. And also we have HowlRound streaming uh, the event live. So if afterwards, yes, hello HowlRound. <laughs> if afterwards you feel that you want to point someone toward it, you can point them to HowlRound.com and they'll be able to watch it uh, on their own. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to point out before we begin. First of all, the exits. Take a look at the exit signs and in the event of an emergency, move uh, through the closest exit and away from the building. Thank you. And ideally, you would uh, put your phones on silent. Uh, the uh, event is being streamed, and then it's also being recorded. So the, we don't want to hear your phones in that, if, if, um, if you would oblige us. Thank you. Uh, and so a couple other uh, pieces of business. Uh, Toshi is with us uh, at Arts Emerson in the Office of the Arts. Now, thanks to the Doris Duke Foundation, which was just announced, uh, will, is with us through December of 2021 as resident artist at Emerson College. Yes. 
Yes, she is. She'll be in and out of Boston over the next 18 plus months. Part of how that residency is going to kick off is that we're doing a return visit of her incredible uh, opera, Parable of the Sower, which will return in March to this very theater, and we are going to sell this theater out. We have five shows, so after this, everybody get busy. We're going to sell out all five shows. We sold out the Paramount last time, so we moved it over here, promised her we'd sell this one out too. As part of the return of Parable of the Sower, we're going to be doing a citywide read of Octavia E. Butler's novel. And for those of you who would like to join that read, this is the um, advance warning. <laughs> this will be, uh, there will be resources available through our website. There will be book clubs gathering in libraries and neighborhoods uh, all over the city. And you can also read the book on your own and join in in that manner. Uh, and then the, so the read will officially launch on January 19th. And if you'd like to find a club to join, you'll be able to find that on our website. Uh, if you actually, the easiest uh, thing to do is parablereed.com. Parablereed.com will take you to the Arts Emerson page for uh, the read resources, including where to sign up and other kinds of study guides. Parablereed.com, it'll kick off on January 19th officially. You could get started now. And then it, it culminates in the March 13th event at the JFK Library, where Toshi Regan will be the guest of the library in conversation on January 13th. That's sure to sell out, so you might want to make your plans early for that. Everyone who reads the book and is part of that book club is welcome to join us then at the library there. So uh, th that's it for tonight. Um, thank you for coming out in the snow, and I will get out of the way and turn it back over to the incredibly uh, brave and undaunted Eliana. All right, thank you, David. Uh, next, we're gonna have a selection by my homies, the Skin Tones, who are an acapella group comprised of Emerson students of color that seeks to elevate their voices by singing on the music of only people of color. Come on out. Hey. hey guys. Thank you so much for coming out today. Oh, oh, this one, okay. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, it's a scorcher out there. <laughs> Woo! Um, we're gonna start off uh, just by doing something that I think makes this acapella group really special, which is what we call a sound garden. Um, apropos of nothing, one of us will start uh, singing a riff or a note or creating a beat, and then the rest of us will join on in this wonderful, lovely garden of sound. <laughs> Do my hair toss, check my nails, baby, how you feeling? Hair toss, check my nails, baby, how you feeling? Watch out, tie to the floor, going to the show design. 
enough. Keep it moving. Yes, Lord. Try to get some new. In their swimwear, go into the pool. Come now, come dry your eyes. You know you're a star. You can touch the sky. I know that it's hard, but you have to try. If you need advice, let me simplify. If he don't love you anymore, then walk your fine ass out the door. I do my hair ties, check my nails. Baby, how you feeling? Hair ties, check my nails. Baby, how you feeling? Feeling good as hell. Baby, how you feeling? Feeling good as hell. Ooh, girl, need to kick out the shoes. Time to take a deep breath. Time to focus on you. All the big fights, long. That you've been through, I got a bottle of tequila I've been saving for you. Boss up and change your life. You can have it all, no sacrifice. I know we did you wrong, we can make it right. So go and let it all hang out tonight. He don't love you anymore. So walk your fine ass out the door. And do your hair ties, check my nails. Baby, how you feeling? Hair ties, check my nails. So walk your fine ass out the door, cause he don't love you anymore. So walk your fine ass out the door. Check my nails, baby, how you feeling? Feeling good as hell. Hair ties, check my nails, baby, how you feeling? Feeling good as hell. Hair ties, check my nails. If you want more of that, we have a concert next Thursday, uh, 8 p.m. in 172 Tremont Street. All right. Uh, thank you, Skin Tones. Um, <laughs> I get it. We're brown. Quiet down. Okay. Um, all right. Fans of the podcast, How to Survive the End of the World, already know that creators Autumn Brown and Adrian Marie Brown are both writers, activists, and facilitators who provide a guide on how to navigate and sur survive the world with grace, rigor, and curiosity. Please, welcoming, please join me in welcoming Autumn Brown and Adrian Marie Brown to the stage. Toshi Reagan, everyone. All right. All right. Let's just keep screaming let's, for an hour. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> just screaming. Hi. Hi. Welcome. There's people here. I know. That's always exciting. This mm. is um, this is our friend Toshi. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of famous. <laughs> a little bit famous. Oh my God! Toshi. Her parents are here. Where are they? Do you see them? They're right there. <gasps> parents. Mm-hmm. And my beloved is here. They're beloved. right there. Oh my God. Your beloved. <laughs> Not to get confused. Yeah. I love you too. Yeah. It's all love. <laughs> I'm Autumn Brown, a queer science fiction writer, a theologian, a mother of dragons. Wow. Yes, and a healing justice facilitator for social movements living in Minneapolis. Okay. Which is colder than Boston. Is that necessary? Mm hmm. 
I'm Adrienne Marie Brown, author of books, <laughs> um, plural books. <laughs> <laughs> Fan of Beyonce, <laughs> Virgo, <laughs> with a Scorpio moon. Was that necessary? Absolutely, <laughs> so necessary. And um, someone just gave me a t-shirt that I wanted to wear tonight so everyone could see. It says, every student, every child, every child deserves a black teacher. Mm. So I thought since we were in a college learning environment, Mm -hmm. that that would be relevant. Because y'all chill. Mm -hmm. um, and this anything else about my bike? Oh, and I live in Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Also very cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this <laughs> is our podcast, How to Survive the End of the World. About surviving apocalypse with grace, rigor, and curiosity. And we're so happy to be here. OMG. And we're happy because we have one of our very favorite guests of all time, Toshi Reagan, back on the show with us tonight as our special guest. Very special. Um, Toshi's going to be doing the Parable of the Sower Opera right here in this majestic glorious theater. theater. Oh, it's majestic. It is majestic. It is majestic. I would, I would definitely say it the majesty. Um, so we're going to have some talks tonight. Hi, Toshi. Anything you want to say to welcome yourself to the peoples? Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other things to know about Toshi is Toshi, on the podcast interview that we did with her, broke down for everyone the only correct approach to the electoral process. So if you missed it, go back and listen. If you have any friends who are confused about, like, how do I engage? What do I do? They should just listen to it, and that's the right way. Um, <laughs> So, I'm, as I said, I'm a Virgo, so rightness is my thing, mm -hmm. and um, that's important to know. So, yeah, do you want to ask a question? We have, basically what we're going to do is ask some questions and have some conversations up here, and then at some point we'll have you all talk to each other a little bit, and then we'll do it all together. Mm -hmm. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, exciting. Yeah. Be ready for participation. Yeah, but not like too much, just mm -hmm. like gentle. Yeah, and we'll give guidance also on how to participate. Yeah, the year's so almost over. You won't so. have to make it up. Yeah. Um, cool. So I think the question that we wanted to start with is, so it's December 2019. It's almost 2020, which is hard to believe. A whole new uh, decade. Literally, yeah. uh, we're living in the future. Yes. And um, we wanted to begin with a question um, first for you, Toshi, about what is your good news here at the end of the decade? Mm. Ooh, so much good news. Um, doing a parable, opera, I, people come up to me all the time and say, we're in the time of parable, you know, kind of all is lost, we're in the time, oh my <laughs> God, it's happening. Yeah. And then I'm like, did you just, get in a car with a stranger that you called to your door through an app? Did someone you don't know like deliver dinner because you were hungry through an app? Did you walk outside and go to the corner and do something? Did you, I just did some like all these things. Are you and on a date because Are you of on a date because of the app? I mean, there is uh, parable conditions all over, the, the worst of parable of the sower conditions all over the planet. But if you are not in those conditions, it is excellent, not just good news. And actually, you are not to bend in energetically into the idea that it is going to happen to you. You have to bend in the other direction, mm. and it is your job to rescue and save everybody else on the earth. <laughs> not so much applause about that, but <laughs> it is the only way that you will exist and your children right. will exist, right. and flowers will exist, and trees will exist, and water will exist. You have one job, been out of the idea, yes, and use everything you have. And I'm happy to say I know so many people who are with gusto taking on that as a way to live their lives um, into the next decade, and, um, and that is good news. Mm. That is mm. very good news. That's such good news. Ain't that good news? Mm -hmm. Ain't that good news? 
All right. What about you, Autumn? What's your good news at the end of this decade? Mm. Hmm. What is my good news? Try. I think my good news that I'm here to share is that liberation is possible. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, this year gave me kind of a new um, sympathy for climate change deniers. Um, <laughs> because it is very easy to be in denial about the actual conditions of your life. Yes, it um, is because it can be very overwhelming to actually have to acknowledge the, the actual conditions of your life. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like in many ways over the last few years, I was like a climate change denier about the conditions of my own life. Like there's like uh -huh. a forest burning all around me and I'm like, no, there's no forest burning around me. And also I live here, so I'm not leaving. And, That's right. Um, and when I turned and confronted the actual conditions of my life, it became very clear to me what the path was mm -hmm. towards health and wellness and freedom. Um, and it, it's interesting because going through what I've gone through over the last year, a lot of people in my life have, have reflected back to me how brave I am. And one of the things that felt really clear to me as I was making choices, like moving myself towards liberation, changing my life, was that like bravery is the thing that we do when no other choice even appears obvious to us. That the thing that we're doing is the only thing that appears to be the obvious right choice mm. um, or the obvious next move. And, and that for me felt like the, the liberatory path was making the only right choice. And hmm. I feel like a completely different person going yeah. into the next decade. Yeah. And it's been very beautiful for me. So I just wanted to like share that with all of you and share that with y'all that like it actually is possible inside our lives and inside the world that we live in. I love that. Yeah. Um, What's your good news at the end of this decade? Well, I wanted to say it's been so good to live inside the arcs of both of your good news. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I, I can't believe that like at the beginning of this decade, for me, there was no opera, right? There was just like the books and the prayer of a film, you know, like I hadn't imagined beyond that. And to now get to live in a world where like this thing that I love and worship and keep returning to, this text that feels so important that everyone knows is now coming into the world in a new way. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oof, I'm so grateful to live in that world, that reality. Mm -hmm. And The uh, time of the parable opera. The time of the parable of the opera. Mm. The parable of the opera. Yeah, mm -hmm. parable yeah. of the opera. Sure. <laughs> Let's do it. That was then, the third book. <laughs> <laughs> and then I feel like watching you go through your liberation process is has been um, a great gift to me as well. You know, I feel like when you're related to someone who is going through liberation, it means that everything must change, right? Mm. Um, and so I feel like it, it dusts off everything, you know, like everything gets shaken up. Um, so thank y'all for living into the good news that has been coming to you. Um, I feel like my good news is like satisfaction is medicinal. Mm. Been like that. Mm. Um, <laughs> I've been in this period of immense satisfaction in my life, and I'm 41. This is this year I turned 41. It, Look at amazing. all that 41. Look at all this 41, honey. I work hard for this 41. You yeah, know? you did. I worked hard for each of these years. I can feel that in me, but I know. I also am like, oh, and there's more to come but I feel so much satisfaction at this moment. And I think um, the way that I've been socialized a lot of times is you, you don't focus on your satisfaction. You focus on um, what you don't have yet, how hard everything is, how tired you are, how dusty you are, how bad the day dusty. was. You know, it's just sort of like, oh, someday I'm gonna get somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Like I feel like so many people are oriented towards some other time when things will be good. Yeah. And for me, it has felt very important to be like, I'm a black, fat, queer woman who is happy now, today. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful to, you know, I interact with kids that way, like, hey, <coughs> I love you, and I'm happy, and I love me. And that's very important. It feels like all of the things in my post-apocalyptic vision 
are based in children getting to see happy, fat black women. Somehow yes. it's all connected. Yes, um, it is all connected. <laughs> it's all connected. That is the life force yes. through which everything comes. It's, I, I think so. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but you know, I feel like professionally, personally, you know, I'm like, I feel like I'm well loved. Um, I feel like I have, have written things and I'm like, I feel good about it. You know, it's not like, there's also that part where the satisfaction, cause it's hard. It's hard to complete something, you know, enough that you're like, good enough, right? And I feel like I've done work that I'm like, good enough. I'm satisfied. Yeah. So now I'm about to head on sabbatical, uh, December 12th. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's exciting to me to also be like, okay, what is the next thing that wants to arise? Um, but I feel like often dreams or longings arise from dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious about the idea of having a longing arise in me from a place of satisfaction. Mm. Like, okay, as a satisfied person, what do I long to now bring forth or what do I want to yeah. let come through? Yeah. So mm. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm curious and yeah. interested. So I brought this tarot deck. Um, this is a new tarot deck. Uh, it's called Modern Witch Tarot. It's so cute. For the modern witches out there. For the modern there. witches out there. No dusty witches. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow. I don't know why dusty is this just like theme, available this to me theme right now. It's gonna go into the title of the um, show. <laughs> so we thought it would be nice to pull a card now for 2019 and this decade behind us, right? A past card. What are we leaving behind? Is that baited? Oof. Well, we are leaving behind the Six of Swords. Can you hold Ooh. that up? I'll read this. That is a very... What does it mean? All right, so this is what's behind us. You're going to need to make a difficult choice, one that may, might feel painful and almost impossible. However, you know deep down that this is the best path forward. It's definitely going to be rough waters for a while, and your emotions may fight you. But logic tells you this is what you need to do. Be well as you walk forward into the unknown. What? Wow, that's good. I want to put that also into. Does that resonate? I know. I'm like, we gotta keep. I was like, we're still in the unknown now, y'all. Mm -hmm. So, but that's what was behind us. We got to the unknown. We made the hard choice. We made the hard choice. Mm -hmm. Did y'all make a hard choice this past decade? <laughs> All right, so we're hearing later, a lot of like sucking of teeth, so I think yes. Mm -hmm. Later, maybe we'll pull a card for what's coming. We'll see if we're ready for all that. Mm -hmm. All right, beautiful. Thank you, Adrienne. Yeah, that thank was you. Great. Also, your child just texted me. That's really? What did she say? Um, they said hi. Oh, that child. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I have say three. hi back. <laughs> <laughs> Right. See, I got my children <laughs> phones a couple of months ago, and they have now just started. They will only text other people. Me, they text. They me won't. Mostly. They won't text or call me. So. But they love you so much. They do love me. I they know that they text love me. Like, are you with my mom? <laughs> so. Just like you could just text me anyway. Um, <laughs> so, um, Toshi, we wanted to engage you a little bit around um, the opera, and particularly thinking about your, um, your time here at Emerson, you're in residency here for the next year and a half, and um, you know, I really experience you as one of the great teachers of our time, mm. that you teach through song, you teach through writing, you teach through presence, the way that you hold space while you're performing, um, and um, and also just the way you hold space in, in any room. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you are um, interpreting Octavia's Butler, Octavia Butler's work as a teaching tool for our time. Um, what do you hope to awaken in people mm -hmm. as a part of the process of engaging with her work in this way? Mm. Um. Thank you. I think um, one of the first times we did the opera, it was the US debut. It was at um, University of North Carolina by 
um, Carolina Performing Arts. And before we did that, they gave me a fellowship. And the fellowship was uh, called the Still Fellowship. And it was, um, I was supposed to meet a, a faculty person and the faculty person um, would then think about um, from their work how they would like to engage the community yeah. that they were in, and then um, and then and through the uh, vehicle of art, maybe we could do some communication. And one of the things was uh, you have a, a school and faculty, and they were like, we know so many things, and we <laughs> and then we don't necessarily know how to get it from you know this academic world into the general stream. And so that's where the artists came in. Um, and I had a dinner and they said, they invited all of these faculty members in and they said, which one do you wanna work with? And I was like, they're all awesome, I'll work with everybody. Who wants to work with me? And- mm -hmm. um, Turn and it I, around. Yeah, uh, they were amazing. I wanted to work with all of them. And mm -hmm. I went home and I drew a picture because I just didn't really know what it would look like, but I drew a circle and I put these lines and I put issues that are in the book and then I kind of surfaced them through the faculty of what might be issues through hmm. um, in that community. Uh -huh. And then it took, and then I'm still going back. And then I decided that the show would not be the point of its existence, but a path yeah. would be the point and the show would be a belly button. Um, it would be a place for us to gather. Hmm. And, a belly but, butt. Yeah. But all of these things could happen walking into it, and it could continue walking out of it. Uh -huh. And um, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents surface so many um, issues um, that, you know, in, the, in this country in particular, but on the planet, that literally you can do anything. Yes. You can gather around any issue. And that also, I didn't have to be the the a center voice like I make the I make it accessible but I don't know these communities better right. than people who live in them mm. right. I don't understand them better so I would be like what do y'all want to do <laughs> and That's right. um, and how do you want to do it and I tried to be a good listener and um, and so now everywhere that we have done the opera this process happens I come into the community and I come back um, over and over again before the show happens, and then I come back after the show happens. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then here we have you know, this great residency um, that's funded. Um, Art Zimmerson has done a, an incredible job of, of helping to create a circle, a giant circle uh -huh. of people who will be engaging through, throughout the next year and a half and beyond. I don't really see an end. Um, in collaboration with each other, but the cool thing is I will bring people from the other cities here to engage. And so oh. the idea is to break the borders, to break this idea that yes. I'm here and something happening over there is not affecting me here. Right. And to get everybody who has these skills, for example, like food justice warriors, you know, That's they're great. everywhere, you know, so bring them together and then we all go out and do what we gotta do. So that that's mm -hmm. it's bananas it's, it's not it's not simple it's mm -hmm. bananas but it's awesome i love it i love it mm. that's how we doing it that's how we doing it yeah. <laughs> that's how i we love doing it. it i love it yeah i feel like you are um you know i think of it dandelion style right like dandelions contain an entire community structure inside of each little piece of them so when a dandelion blows and it seeds somewhere it's like a whole community is popping up here. It's not just yeah. me, one dandelion, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm looking at the communities you've been landing in now and seeing that. And it's beautiful to come behind you, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, we did a, an emergent strategy immersion in Durham and it was like you had created so much fertile ground mm. of people who were thinking about apocalypse and in a, as a place of possibility mm. <clears throat> and thinking about, <clears throat> sorry, y'all, I'm recovering from an illness. Um, but is it though? I hope I'm recovering. Yeah, no. <laughs> anyway, um, so the thing I was saying, we came into this space and all these folks had a sense of not just possibility, but also culture is not something outside of or mm -hmm. sprinkled on top of 
how we do movement work, but it's actually like, oh, a core function is what are the songs we're singing to each other? Mm -hmm. um, what is the harmonization? Like, what do we sound like? How do we feel together? So I just want to, I'm grateful for how you're moving it. And um, we want to talk, you know, one of the things we were, we, we teased y'all with was talking about climate apocalypse. And teaser. <clears throat> it's always fun. So, and one of the things I keep thinking about is how do we reframe our concept? Because I hear people say, we need to save the planet. Like, how do we protect the planet? The planet's going to die, the planet's all this stuff. And I'm just like, I, I have a different frame on it, which I think is, um, <clears throat> I think is useful right now to think about how do we actually get ourselves in right relationship with this planet, which is very resilient and very strong and going to be fine um, after we go extinct if that's what we choose to do. Um, and right now that's what we're choosing to do, right? Mm -hmm. To just be like, oh, you know, we are not um, being victims of this. It's like we're making choices every single day that propel us in that direction. And um, so as we think about like 2020 and the next decade to come and what we're creating in that time, I would love to hear what do you think is the first move or sort of the first domino that we need to, to do in order to get ourselves back into right relationship or start moving back into right mm. relationship with this planet and you know, not go extinct. Yeah, I mean, we kind of, in Octavia's universe, we blow it. Yeah, big and time. We, and we cease to exist on the earth. Mm -hmm. And um, I think part of our, our situation is that we are very much webbed in to practices um, based on, you know, all these things that are harmful to live your life by. So just the whole, you know, the, the isms, um, class, um, all of the fear of difference, um, and then the economy, mm -hmm. no matter where you are on the spectrum. And we're not good at making fast, hard decisions. Um, we make fast, hard decisions when the danger is right in front of us. Right. But from our wealth and, um, and privilege, it takes us much longer because we probably want to enjoy our wealth and privilege. <laughs> so probably. we're probably. not buying anything <clears throat> for the holidays this year in my family. Mm. Um, we're putting all our money towards, you know, frontline activists and artists and institutions, uh -huh. and we're not buying anything. We don't need anything. We have everything. Everybody's voting in my family. Um, we don't uh -huh. care if we love the person. We're all <laughs> voting. Um, we're voting as a strategy, and we're protecting young people who might choose not to vote, Right. and we're making sure the worst people don't, um, aren't in power and that they can't do what they need to do. So I think we each have to figure out what's our hard turn from the norm we can make and then do it. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. What about you, Autumn? Mm. I, love, I love the framing of like what is the hard, the hard turn or yeah. the hard choice that we have to make that we usually only make when we're under direct threat. And and I think about, um, and you know, we've talked about this before on the show that you know one of the effects of of living under sustained, chronically violent conditions is um, entering a state of dissociation. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I think of it is like, well, you know, we live in a police state. And regardless of whether you are directly targeted by the police, you still are living in the police state. And there's some part of you that's conscious of the fact that that is where you live. Mm -hmm. um, and that part of us tends to get shut down. Um, and so we're moving through, uh, we live in a very, very violent society, a society that's very comfortable with violence. And, we, and I think we all collectively navigate that with a lot of dissociation. Um, and that, I think, is part of why it's hard for us to make those hard turns, because yeah. we're not accustomed to noticing when our threat response is awake <laughs> and yeah. activated in our systems. And that threat response, all, all of the responses that our nervous systems have 
are, it's a very elegant design. It's very intelligent. It's there to serve us. That's right. um, and so to me, one of the things that I think about is, is um, recovering cultural practices and healing practices that help us get in touch with the information mm. that's coursing through our bodies all, at all times so that we mm. can recover a sense of agency, so that we can make decisions that are actually in alignment with our highest good yes. and our deepest values, yeah. so that we can even assess what our values are, right, that are helping us make decisions. Because right now, I think, you know, particularly in social justice and movement spaces, lacking a, a way of being actually embodied with our values, we tend to default to, well, you know, what's their ideology? What's their politic? What's mm -hmm. their principles? And, mm. you know, are they actually like authentic or not, you know? Right. And we, we lose sight of the fact that like, um, from an embodied place, we do know that we are only going to go if we all go together. Mm -hmm. right. There's no one who deserves to be left behind, and there's no one who deserves to go more, right? It's actually all of us. Um, and, but, but I think we can only get there when we're here. We can't get there through like an intellectual process. Mm. I like that. Thank you. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. um, can I just say something? Yeah. You yeah, can it's say, like twenty more things if you. It's wanted. really <laughs> hard. It's really hard work to do, yeah. though. I should say, like once I really started thinking, Toshi, your turn. I was like outside in my neighborhood, and I realized how many people I didn't know. Right. I was like, I and my closest friends are blocks away from me, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh wow, I don't really know nobody right <coughs> near me. Mm -hmm. Um, there's been a lot of change in my neighborhood, so a lot of people have left. And I think it's very hard to, um, you know, it's like, go meet your neighbors yeah. and, like, start a dialogue. <laughs> like, and it's like, you go meet your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of like, yeah, you know, white people who put a $2 million house on my block, I don't want to know you, uh -huh. um, <laughs> you know. Yes. Uh, so it is hard work. I, you hard. know, it, you, it challenges a lot of your your own, sh can I say that word? Shit. Yeah, it challenges your own shit, you know? Quite. Quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's been interesting to think about, like, oh, what are the moves we have to make? And what are the moves I have to make? And I always think about this, Grace Lee Boggs was one of my mentors, and she said that you had to transform ourselves to transform the world. And people love to say that. Mm-hmm. And, and put it in their email. They put it in their tagline, <laughs> What's meme, t-shirt, gif. Uh, yeah, I yeah. know what you mean. You know what I'm talking about. I know what you mean. That thing <laughs> in the bottom. I'm like, who does emails anymore, you know? But <laughs> I know Toshi and I Die try to hard be in contact email. with each other is so funny because you're like, uh, can we do a phone call? I'm like, can we do a text? And you're like, a voice message. <laughs> I'm like, OK. Um, but I think about this piece, like, how do we relieve ourselves from this idea that we are better than, which almost all Americans have baked in a little bit. Like we are better than someone else. And so the fact that we were born in this country means we have the right to some existence that other people don't have a right to. Mm. And um, that when we travel, you know, everything should be organized around how we are. Mm -hmm. And that all the resources of the universe should be organized around how we are. And our we predictable were actually just needs. Talking with our father, uh, he's reading this book, How to Hide an Empire, and it was really moving to me. I had to repost. It. I was like, I want everyone to know about this because I'm like, you don't realize that you are imperial, um, and so part of what I feel like, oh, one of my big hard turns is to really seek out inside myself what are the ways that I think I am better than. Um, anyone else, mm -hmm. and more special than, more deserving than mm -hmm. anyone else, and how easily that comes, right, that comes in. And for the past couple of years, with the books coming out and everything, I get treated in a very special way, like you are special, you mm -hmm. know? And, and you, you know, I'm, I, I, I know I'm like awesome. Yeah. But it, it's not <laughs> that kind of thing of like, no, you're not awesome girl. It's like, it's not that, because the idea is not, I have to shrink any part of myself 
It's more I have to recognize the equal humanity and specialness and beauty of each person. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that. Right now I move through the world and there's certain people who catch my eye. They're sparkly. They seem to be on the same ideological bent. And I'm like, we, you and I, mm -hmm. we're better than. <laughs> right. You know? Right. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. um, so one of the ways I'm making that move is really trying to decentralize myself from the work that I've done in some ways, mm. right? So it's very quickly become like, oh, emergent strategy, Adrian, boom, like that. And I'm like, no, like emergent strategy, like tons of people notice this. Tons of people observe and see mm -hmm. this. Tons of people are already practicing this. I gave a language to something that tons of people are doing. And so how do I move myself out of the center of the narrative mm. of how this gets done? Because the American way is to centralize myself, to brand myself into that narrative, to make it so you have to come to and through me right. to get it. Trademark. And exactly, right? And there's been so much, you know, people telling me that's to what to do. And now pleasure activism, same thing. Like, oh girl, how are you gonna grab it up, wrap mm. it up, don't let anyone mm -hmm. else have some. Um, unless they can pay you for it, right, or whatever. And so trying to be like, no, I want to decentralize these ideas. Like, I want a future in which as many people as possible have access to the idea of themselves as nature, to the idea of right relationship to change, to the idea of pleasure. Like, I want that to be something as many people have as possible. So part of my scholarship over this next period is about that, is mm -hmm. like, not just uh, thinking about like, well, how could I do that? But like, what are the steps I need to take to actually make that kind of thing happen? Um, and then what are the hard skills I want to keep growing up alongside of my philosophical theoretical skills? Yeah. Right? Because I'm like, I can think really good. Like, I'm really into <laughs> my thinking process. But I can imagine, you know, I, I think about that. I'm like, but do I know how to connect with my neighbors? Right? And I know how to connect, again, like with two neighbors. Right? And one of them is three years old. I'm like, we are good. Like, I really understand you. <laughs> You only want to do five minute visits. That's perfect for me. Auntie for the apocalypse. I'm the auntie for the apocalypse. I am. But I don't know how to explain that to a stranger. Like we just made on the road and I'm trying to, you know, they're trying to decide if like I'm worth adding to the caravan of survivors, right? I'm like, I'm really good with theoretical conversations. I can facilitate this meeting. You know, I'm like, no, bitch. Like, can you help me deliver a baby? Can you like <laughs> suture a wound? You know, stuff like that. So I feel like I'm really landing in. And I think everyone, I really feel like that's one thing that Octavia offered us was like, what are the hard skills that go alongside of any other skills that you have? And do you know that now is the time? Now is the mm -hmm. time to have those. And I'll say in the last two weeks of my life, I've had multiple experiences where suddenly something happened very quickly. And I was like, do I know the skill set I need to know if I have to save this person's life? Mm -hmm. Do I know the skill set I need to know if I need to intervene right now, the police are coming? And um, some of this, some of the stuff is like, yeah, I really do. I have some skills. And some of the stuff I was like, I do not, but I could. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 I will offer that to each of you to really think about that for yourself, not just yourself in the scale of like as a student or a part of something, but like as a human being, if the apocalypse happened on your walk home tonight and suddenly there were people that needed help, dun, dun, what can dun. you do to help them, right? And I think we need to get very tangible about that because, you know, this electoral process, I don't know, you know, I really, I prepare for the post-apocalyptic, like, I'm like, I don't know if this electoral process is going to last too much longer. Like, I think if we have another Trump victory, I think the whole thing might, we just might go Puerto Rico on these people, you know, mm -hmm. just be like, no, right? Bomba riots in the street, mm -hmm. we're done with this. So, and I'm excited about that. So, <laughs> I do want to pull a card now for the coming decade. Mm. All right? So, this will tell us kind of how to prepare for what to be alert for. It's not a future, you know, it's not a, I always say don't try to use the tarot to predict things just for yourself. Yeah, use Octavia for that. All right, you wanna pick the card, Toshi? Sure. Use your left hand. Ooh, beautiful. All right, so before we got the Six of Swords, now we got the Ace of Swords. Wow. That's amazing. <clears throat> so the Ace of Swords, the I essence. I literally just pulled this card like <laughs> three nights ago. You're literally the future. Ah! All right. <clears throat> A rush of clarity and inspiration comes with the beginning of this journey. Mm. You may feel 
as though your thoughts are racing constantly, the wheels are turning and you've reached a revelation. This is just the beginning of a difficult path though. And you'll need all of your wits and reason about you to see it through. Basically what you were just Basically talking about. Basically what we were just talking about. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, and Tara actually, no win. I wanted to say too, in, in relationship to what you were just talking about, and this card feels like a good one for that. Yes. That, um, I think it's one of the other things that we're going to need in the time ahead of us is to stop thinking of organizing as something that certain people do. Yes. Um, that's right. Because. Because that is a hard skill. We think yes. of it right now, I think we tend to think of it as a soft skill because there's like a whole professional sector that's like d built up around people who get paid to organize. Right. And like, you know, I'm like grateful every day that there's like, that people can be paid to do that work. Yeah, we need um, full time. And, and <laughs> when I look at Octavia Butler's work, one of the things that, uh, one of the patterns that you can see yeah. in all of her works is that is the, the protagonist coming into an awareness of their innate capacity mm -hmm. to organize other people yes. and to um, see skills and experiences and stories in other people that can be like called forth and, and organized into like an elegant, yes. um, an elegant set yeah. that moves, that helps people actually move along in a process. Yeah. And that to me feels like one of the skills that, it's a skill that any of us can actually cultivate. The Absolutely. ability, and, and part of it is really just cultivating the ability to, to see other people, to like witness other people in yeah. their gifts, and, and then listen. invite those gifts. Well, and that word invitation feels so crucial to me. Like, I feel like one of the most insidious ways that capitalism has infected our movement spaces is that it drives us to constantly be trying to exclude, to identify like, mm -hmm. here's how you are not me, here's how you are outside, mm -hmm. here's how your analysis is not far enough, your feminism mm -hmm. is not sharp enough, like, here's how you're not me. And we need to shift that whole mentality to invitation. Like, like we don't have enough people, how do, every, how do we see every single person as how can you potentially be part of this liberation struggle? Yeah. And I think even, I keep widening to, you know, it's not just organizers, but we need movement workers. We need lots and lots and lots of people who from whatever position they are in the universe see themselves as shapers of the future. Yes. And I think that Octavia, you know, like that was her thing is, I always think about that in Parable of the Talents after Acorn was, was destroyed and where she's like, okay, I'm not giving up my vision, now I'm going door to door. Mm, and yeah. anyone who accepts my message, we will stay in the conversation and I will, we will roll together. Right. And I, I notice, I'm like, oh, I'm not capable of that right now. Right now, I definitely move through the world and I'm like, you need to be black with like your hair shaved on the sides and like a certain like you know aesthetic and then I'm like okay I can see the justice in you <laughs> you know <laughs> right and I'm trying to like oh how do I widen my I can see the justice in you widen my peripheral vision again you know that I'm like oh there's so many people actually who care mm -hmm. right how many of y'all would say like I want to shape the future right so <laughs> there's like not someone I'm like, there happy like, <laughs> I don't know why y'all came out here tonight. Okay, but hopefully we open and inv invite more of you to feel that it's not that you choose to. You are definitely shaping the future. It's just are you shaping it towards the same old familiar or are you shaping it towards something new? Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing. And I think we need to be inviting more and more people to be like, we, through our practices, will shape something new. Mm -hmm. what, let's do that mm -hmm. intentionally. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let me see if we have another thing here. Our agenda is on my phone. We do. Well, and actually, it feels like... Oh, and it's your turn. I mean, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn. Um, Girl, that's, that was great. Thank you. There's like, there is a musical being performed in the next theater over. That's what's so happening. I could just go over it's there. It's just we're feeling all of that. Exactly. Um, and there's a musical between us. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, I, I think it, in relationship to everything we've been talking about, there is this question of, well, what are the actual barriers to us being able to see our capacity to vision mm -hmm. and shape the future with intention. Yeah. Um, and Toshi, one of the other questions we were interested in asking you is, is your perspective on like, what are the barriers that you see people still having around acknowledging and being 
like in the reality of climate apocalypse? Like, mm. what do you feel like are people's barriers to acting? I mean, I know my barriers <laughs> are, you know, I know what I know and I want what I want. Mm. And, um, and I have to be taught like new things mm. and I have to want to learn new mm. things. <laughs> and I have to be aggressive because I have to pay attention that now people are ringing a bell really loud. And so now I'm like, oh, wow, I actually hear it. Uh -huh. and, um, and I just think a lot of us are, um, are inside of that process, uh -huh. you know, trying to figure out like, you know, am I gonna hear this bell? Am I gonna pretend like it's not ringing? Um, and I think that's, that's it. We're also like, yo, they got us. They got us. Yeah. And we're gonna have to, um, you know, divest from these systems because they are uh, sending us, I mean, I love, you know, gadgets. Me too. But they're being used so poorly yeah. and um, so violently that we have to each make decisions. Like, why are we just accepting everything that they give us? Mm -hmm. oh, why are you tying your bank account to like 20 different apps? Like, why are you doing that? Why are you getting rid of cash? Why are you trusting these business people? Right. I mean, we need cash to run away. That's right. Why are you going to businesses that don't accept cash? You know, like all of that has to change. So. Why are you paying uh, your taxes? Yeah. Like, you know, you don't want to go to jail. <laughs> they got us on the taxes. It's not strategic yes. at this point, but it's it not. will be. Mm -hmm. I learned that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It will be. Yes. So I just, I, yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. I also think there's something about scale, right? Like mm -hmm. the what we're up against is is a system that's able to roll things out on a large scale and so it feels kind of ubiquitous. It's like, oh, it's just everyone's doing this now. Like I remember um, having this month where I had been very staunchly like, I will not use the facial recognition thing on my phone and I will never have Alexa in my house. And I went to all these like, I was going to diff visit different hardcore organizers or whatever and they all had like Alexa in the house and all this stuff that I was like, what are we doing this now? I mean like, we don't mind, we don't care. And it was powerful to me to be like, oh, all of us are letting this slip in, and, yeah. but it's because the scale is so large. I think that's part of it. And then I think hopelessness. I think hopelessness is maybe the largest thing we're actually up against at this point. Hmm. Because I think a lot of people now are like, I get it, I understand. I understand like that we're up against the end times. I it's understand over. that like white supremacy is there and patriarchy is there and like some of this stuff is coming down and whatever. I get that, mm -hmm. but I also think that there's this deep hopelessness. People feel like there's nothing to be done. Um, there's no way we can do it in time. They're, we're too small, they're too big, all this stuff. And mm. I feel like when I go to speak to college campuses like this, a lot of what I feel coming from young people is like a, you know, let's, let's just live it out kind of mm. energy. And <clears throat> I keep thinking about the never ending story and how it has shaped my whole politic, but that you know, if you haven't seen it, you must see this film. The the and the, it can't be spoiled. I don't think it can be spoiled, but it's it's just this film how the nothingness, right? This nothingness, which is how like when I think of capitalism, like the essence of capitalism, to me, it's like a nothingness that is that just spreads everywhere. Yeah. Where you're like purchasing and purchasing and never satisfied. There's nothing mm. that's actually touching you um, in your heart where it matters and that you can spend your hours consuming nothingness, like consuming meaninglessness, consuming things that don't move you, like truly move you and change you and mm -hmm. challenge you. And um, that, that we've structured our whole society, the sameness, you know, that you can travel and be in Virginia or Georgia or Texas mm -hmm. or all these different places and it looks the same more and more, like that there's a, a landscape sameness that is spreading. Everywhere is a big box store and a strip mall and, you know, like to go to New Orleans or someplace that's still holding on tight to its identity, it's like, it's a revelation, you yeah. know? It's like a culture, ah, ah, that makes my heart beat, that makes mm -hmm. me feel alive, you know? And so I'm like, 
I think part of our job, whether we are, think of ourselves as organizers, movement workers, whatever, is to combat that hopelessness, that sameness, that nothingness, to remind people what it feels like to actually be alive and, and have intention and be able to move something from your agency, like move something from your mind, create something, mm -hmm. and that we have it. We all start with that. You know, this is why I love kicking it with my three-year-old friends, because I'm like, mm. they're just like, I make the whole world. <laughs> you are going to get me a pancake. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know this for sure. I'm in charge. And it's like, oh, right, that is so invigorating. Yeah. And to go to places, I would just got to be in Puerto Rico last week, and to be in a space where everyone has told Puerto Rico, y'all don't matter. You don't matter to us. You have a hurricane, and we'll leave you for months with no power. You don't matter. And to be amongst the people who are like, we do. And we are going to assert ourselves, and we are mm -hmm. going to uprise. Mm -hmm. And it's so, I mean, it was invigorating. I get chills every time I remember like, what it felt like to be in that aliveness mm -hmm. and, and being like, oh, how do we bring that back out to everyone and remind people, like, we are not gone. Chile, Puerto Rico, Lebanon, mm -hmm. we are not done. Right. We are right. still rising up. It's happening here now every day. And I think, I think there's no time to waste. You know, it's like, oh, bring it up at the dinner table. <laughs> you know, right. aliveness. Like, right. fight with people if you need to. Disrupt the nothingness. Like, how do you get into people's awareness? Like, mm -hmm. we're not done yet. Yeah. Don't give up, you know? Mm. Beautiful. So, yeah. Anyway, feeling a lot. <laughs> Are y'all feeling a lot? Do you want to talk to each other? Okay. <laughs> part of feeling alive is feeling connected to the other human beings around you. Intriguing. Do you want to set us up for sure. a little something song? We're going to make it super sweet and easy. So yeah. we're just going to Don't worry, you don't do have to touch each other. No touching. <laughs> Unless you want to. Yeah. Um, uh, and you both consent to it. Um, sure. So... <laughs> <laughs> so what we wanted to do is have y'all just time travel, just a glimpse, right? Just a, like, doop, 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 just a little bit ahead. So let's just go to, like, 2024, right? Um, which is the parables are set, 2024. That's where we start to introduce ourselves to our characters. And we wanted to ask you, like, you're interacting with some future version of yourself four years along from now-ish, four or five years. And so really add that number to your age currently. That's a way to helpfully time travel. Be like, oh, I'll be that age. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself, something has happened and humans have started to shift and head. This hard turn is happening, right? Humans, have, and it can happen so quickly, right? Think about how quickly our country shifted after 9-11. Think mm -hmm. about major shifts that happen, right? So something has happened and this hard turn has begun. And I want you to ask your future self, how did we do this? How did we make this turn? What was the one thing that I did that helped? Yeah? So have that conversation with each other. Both of you, you can ask the other person, how did you do it? You're both in 2024 20, now, okay? How did you do it? And both of you the take a, a turn bit? answering. Yeah, so you can see each other's faces. Hey. Oh, y'all so cute. Oh my goodness, look at how many of y'all there are. Hi. All right, so turn to the person next to you. No threesomes for now, unless you absolutely unless must. Unless you have to, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> you wouldn't ask for some tea. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I was wondering about that. I was like. Tea. And then after this. If you haven't switched, make sure you switch sides.
Okay. Okay, now that we've completed our photo shoot. The real shoot, reason. <laughs> so wrap up that sentence, let the words fall away. <coughs> Finding a graceful end to the sentence coming out of your mouth. Take a deep breath in. Let it out. Turn and just observe anyone who might still be talking. <laughs> Inception, that movie taught me a lot about letting people know they're wrong. Um, it's, it's, it's a scary movie. It's a terrifying movie, but I loved it um, as a facilitation teaching tool. Mm -hmm. um, did you each have a response? Did you each have an answer? Something come to you? Yeah? I would love, like, maybe a couple of brave people can just call out really loud what your hard Ooh. turn was. Wholeness. Wholeness. Nice. Listening. Experimentation, listening. Acceptance. Uh-huh. What was that? Community. Mm. Survival. Forgiveness. Oh. Jax. Hi. <laughs> oh. Hi, Boo. Yeah. Oh, I'm okay. Jeezy. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> Cooperation. I believe in yeah. that. Speaking from the heart. Okay. Mm. Okay, mm. that's specific. That's right. What? <laughs> it's all magic. I heard feminine practice. Is that what you you oh, yeah. I know. I was just saying it's magical that you keep talking at the same time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank y'all. Intergenerational spaces. Mm. Awesome. Beautiful. Just being really kind. It's true. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not rocket science. It's not actually that hard. It's like so much easier than rocket science. I tried rocket science the other day and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> this mm -hmm. is harder than was I thought. Was that during Nintendo? <laughs> it was, it was mm -hmm. a game. <laughs> but I was like, I want to know what rocket science actually feels like trying it. It turns out you have to know a lot of other sciences. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> And math. <laughs> so, thanks, y'all. Um, that's, that's a little game you can play with as many people as you want. Like, bring this to the dinner table. Start engaging people in this conversation. Like, if it was going to turn, what would you have to do? Because as soon as someone identifies what they know, like, we know what we would have to do. Once you say it out loud, it makes it harder to deny that you need to do it. And it makes it um, faster, right? It's like, oh, I could start doing it. And then to start, start being kind it. today. Yeah. Like, you could be kind right now <laughs> as you leave this place. And be kind to yourself right now as you're sitting here. Like, why haven't I done it already? Just be kind. Just so you haven't. Here you are. Accept that. Cooperate with yourself. Do it. Um, and it will be done. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things we're going to do. Um, one, Toshi, I wanted us to tell them about the thing we're going to do um, because I think it's going to be cool. Do you want to tell them? Do you want me to tell them? You tell them. All right. 
So Toshi and I are about to start recording something that we're going to be releasing over the next few months, um, next year, and it's going to be a podcast that goes basically chapter by chapter through the parables and pulls out like the relevant, like what are the lessons, the political framework, like what is everything we need to understand about it in this moment. Um, and we really wanted to release It's like a it. wind down for the parables. Yes, yeah. it's, it's exactly. It's like, <laughs> you just need to get a deeper vibe. And for us, like, you know, both of us in different ways, our lives are completely, you know, wrapped Insane. around this text mm -hmm. now. Um, both emergent strategy and pleasure activism and Octavius Brew, all the things that I worked on are all rooted in it. Yeah. Obviously the parables opera is rooted in it, but also the way that you're moving the work is deeply rooted in how um, how how earth seed was spreading, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you actually go and you build a relationship and you build until there's a sense of an understanding so that if you leave, the understanding does not leave. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna talk about it. Yay. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. Um, and so on December 10th, you can send a lot of vibes in our general direction because yeah. that's gonna be one of our first big days of recording. Yay. Are you down? So, should we do some Q and some A? Y'all want to do some, do you want to ask us questions? Okay. <laughs> so, okay, can we make sure uh -huh. we don't end up with like one of those bad Q and A's? So, we wanted to give a little, we wanted to give a little guidance <clears throat> around this. So, <laughs> yes. I would like everyone to repeat after me. I am smart. I, I am smart. smart. I have good ideas. I, I have, have good, good ideas. ideas. My thoughts are mine. My, My thoughts, thoughts are mine. mine. Great. So that's out of the way. <laughs> so now when you come to the microphone, <laughs> you're going to ask a question. <laughs> okay? <laughs> And it doesn't have to be like the most brilliant question, right? It could just be like, Autumn, what is your favorite thing to eat for breakfast? You know, like I'm, really, we're, yeah. we're totally open yeah. to most kinds of questions. But please do make sure, what was that? Where'd you get that jumpsuit? <laughs> mm. Yeah. That could be a question that they ask. They that can be, ask that could be a question that you ask. I'm not gonna give it away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta work, you gotta at least walk to the microphone and ask that question. At the end of the show, I just tear it off. Anyway, so yeah, so come, f there's mics on either side here. You can just come as you feel uh, called to ask a question. Yes. You're like, I sat in front, honey. <laughs> mm -hmm. See, that was smart. <laughs> I see you. Um, well, I'll go for it. I got it at Express, <laughs> <laughs> along with several other excellent outfits. Um, mm. And thank you. Um, so the question is, um, how do we navigate the, the apparent tension between um, meeting our immediate needs and, and creating a future? Um, a sustainable future. And I would say, you're probably not gonna be surprised to hear my response to this, that that in and of itself is a very false binary, right? And I think one of the ways that, that the capitalist economy particularly acts on us is by presenting us with false binaries that appear real. Right? And, and false solutions. Hmm? And false solutions. And false solutions, right? And a lot of the political work that I do, when I'm, when I'm doing political strategy work with movement organizations, a lot of that work is focused on narrative and helping us to figure out, like, what are the false solutions that are taking up a lot of space in the narrative we have around the problem, and how do we push those false solutions out? 
mm. of, of the narrative frame and push into the frame the actual visionary alternative that will meet people's needs, right? Because a lot of the ways that we're meeting people's immediate needs aren't actually meeting people's needs, right? right. That's right. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I think about, I think that, you know, anytime we're presented with a binary, we have to, like, begin just by by questioning the binary and breaking, and, and breaking it down <laughs> and then looking at how, you know, I, you know we, we've done a lot of work in relationship to, um, you know, this, this concept that, like, any issue that we are confronted with, someone is already creating solutions, right? Mm. Usually those people are on the margins of society and they're already creating the solutions because they've been having to for a minute, right? And so we want to look to the people who are most impacted by the issue to figure out like what solutions are they already generating. Many of the solutions that we need right now are very old, right? Many of them are just rooted, rooted in cooperation, right? Mm -hmm. Taking the resources that we see as you know, the resources that we think are going to meet our individual, our immediate needs, we, we see them right now through streams that are very highly individuated. The way that we actually meet people's needs is by collecting those resources mm -hmm. and distributing them in a collectivized way, right? So I'm a part of a worker co-op. Yeah. <laughs> Co-ops are sexy. It's called Aorta. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's called Aorta. And, you know, and I mean, and it is, it's brave work to like throw in your financial future with 12 other people, right? Or with even one other person. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, truly. <laughs> um, but it's actually smarter yes. to throw in with 12 other people than exactly. one other person. Turns out, <laughs> turns out it's a better arrangement. That's great. Yeah. That's good to know. <laughs> awesome. LOL. Do you want to take that on, Toshi? <laughs> no, that was I'll stop there. That yeah, was it for me. I think that was great. I think the only thing I would add to that is my little trick that I've been working with is when I have an individual need that needs to get met, I try to ask myself, like, how in my ideal world would this need get met? And then act accordingly. And often the answer is uh, ask for help, mm. which is not what I ever want to do. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So maybe, yeah, let's go over here. We'll just keep toggle back and forth. Toggling. Toggle. Toggle. Hi, everyone. Hey. Um, the question I wanted to ask is, um, as just people from very different parts of the group, the question of survival, um, the stress of survival is constantly present um, for your family, for you, et cetera, et cetera, mm. on and on. And so how did, what work did you do to shift from thinking constantly about Okay. I want to hear you answer that question. <laughs> um, I have to say, I'm pretty petrified. Um, you know, these uh, black women been disappearing yes. um, all over the country mm -hmm. and not being looked for. And um, I'm worried. And I don't know how to solve that. Um, you know, I'm like, we can see everything, but somehow we can't see women when they're being abducted right off the streets. Yes. And, that scares me. I don't feel abundant when I think about it. I feel really scared. I got a lot of, um, I got a lot of people. And, um, mm. and so I think that um, I know doing the work in raising my voice, but I think that it's, it's like one thing I want to say is that it is really a hard time. Yes. And um, no amount of abundance in one part of your life can cure um, what is super difficult and violent in other parts of your life. That's right. Um, I don't know, I just keep trying, but I think it's also a real thing to actually see where you actually are. Yeah. And, um, and really hold that and try to do some of these other things about cooperation. Like we really gotta take care of each other. Yes. Like we really have to see each other. We really have to have eyes and we really, have to work hard not to get numb to catastrophe. Yeah. Um, we have to see catastrophe and call out catastrophe 
and we have to do extreme things against it. Like, don't take your child back to school when there's been a shooting. Right. Like, just don't go back. Like, you know, don't keep the system running because that's, that's not regular. <sighs> um, yeah. And I know that's not like the, somebody else will do the other part of it, but I will just tell the <laughs> truth. Like, you know, um, I'm really scared about that in particular. Yeah. Um, all of those things remind me of, I know it's for slavery. Yes. And I know it's for probably sexual slavery. Yes. And I know it's for violence. It hurts my heart. Mm -hmm. And I call my daughter five times a day. And I'm in a very abundant place right now. <laughs> but I, if anything happened to her, I would be brought down. I wouldn't care about any of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I need to feel that way about every single um, person that's been um, taken. Yeah. And the system that allows for it to happen more and more. And on social media, it's more and more pictures coming up. And I, I'm like, you can have abundance and you can have hope and you can have um, even some freedoms and you can still see and be yes. honest about what is happening that is, is out of your reach to solve. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that humility has been, for me, the pivot, the place that I can work inside of from scarcity and abundance is humility. Like, that there are things that are beyond what I can touch and that I have had to call in a massive spiritual practice in a different way than I ever understood that I was gonna need. Mm. Like, you know, we were raised in a Christian household. I drifted away from those practices. <coughs> and then for most of my 20s, I didn't have something that I was turning to regularly. And I have found with the disappearances, but also with the police killings, with certain, with Gaza, there's just certain things that I'm like, I want that to be different and I can't change it. Mm -hmm. And I've had to surrender some of what I think of as like, oh, my personal power or whatever. I've had to be willing to get on my knees and cry and pray and ask the universe, you know, like you are up to something that I cannot understand. I have to surrender to that. And if I didn't have that humility, I don't think I could walk out the door each day because it for a long time, I really thought I, I alone have to change it all. I have to figure out how to change it all. I also think that there's something about finding the things that do touch you and mm -hmm. allowing them to touch you. Mm -hmm. If it's the names that touch you, if it's the stories that touch you, but allow yourself to be touched and to grieve for people that you've never met, mm -hmm. to grieve for people that you have met. Um, I've spent this past year in a lot of grief processes. Some of them were my mm -hmm. own and some of them were other people's and I let the grief use me as it needed to use me. And I think that there's something, you know, someone said wholeness, but I think there's something to me about wholeness mm -hmm. is where abundance comes from, not from denying right. the grief and loss and the hardships and the pain, but from actually making yourself wide enough to hold that yeah. all of that is happening. All of that is happening. And not all of it is gonna to happen to you in your lifetime, but all of it is happening. And there's nothing that has ever happened in human history that is not happening now. Now is a civil war, now is slavery, now is an apocalypse, now is a genocide, yes. now is also a love story, now is very romantic, now is a community coming together, now is indigenous sovereignty. All of that is coexisting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, it, for me, is where my abundance is able to, oh, it's all happening yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. The only thing I'll add is like, yeah, it's all happening, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Hi. <laughs> I needed to take it so quick. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, take it further. Yeah, 
practices. What do you practice? Mm. Freedom. Yes. If you call my name. Oh, I wonder, could you call again? Call again and I'll answer. Oh, yeah. Call again and I'll answer. Yeah. I don't think we met before. I heard some old folks talking about you like you were the Lord. Call again and I'll answer. Oh, yeah. Call again and I'll answer. Hey, I say freedom. You must live up amongst the stars. Kind of hard in a world like ours. We talk about you night and day. Oh, we're thinking we might find a righteous way. Freedom over here. Oh, I know it's not always clear. Some of us. We've had our fill. Who's gonna stand up with you? I, 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 I will. Oh, yeah. Hey, you sound like someone we really need. Soul searching armies looking for a victory. Call again and I'll answer. I will. Call again and I'll answer, yeah. We lost our water from hunger and greed, but I can cry you a river of hunger and need. Call again and I'll answer. Call again and I'll answer, yeah. I say freedom. You must live up amongst the stars. It's kind of hard in a world like ours. We talk about you night and day. Oh, we're thinking we might find a righteous way. Freedom over here. Oh, I know it's not always clear. But some of us, we've had our fill. Who's going to stand up with you? I, 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 I will. Oh, yeah. Hey, they trying to build more and more. And they don't even know what they building for. Mm -hmm. But call again and I'll answer. Oh, yeah. Call again and I'll answer. Hey, I'm talking about freedom. To have air to breathe. Freedom to walk the land beneath your feet. A call again and I'll answer. I will call again and I'll answer, yeah. Oh, we talked about you night and day. We're thinking we might find a righteous way. Who's gonna make a sacrifice? Who's gonna live for what is right? Who's gonna make room in this circle of ours? Who's gonna bring you home from the stars? Who's gonna believe that love is real? Who's gonna stand up with you? Who's gonna stand up with you? Who's gonna stand up with you? I, 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 I will. <sighs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Toshi. It was the answer. It was the answer. Mm -hmm. it was yes, the answer. it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh. She was like, I don't even need to ask my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> she's like, actually, I, I, I will. Yes. Yes. Ashe. 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 My first I think love is how you divest from capitalism. I fell in love this year um, at a point in my life where I really thought I was not capable of loving. And one of the things that I've noticed in my relationship with my beloved is how um, disinclined we are towards Netflix. <laughs> Sorry. Like, yes, continue. And like, there, like the, all the things that capitalism like sort of encourages us to consume to fill our time. Yes. Um, and oftentimes we'll do that, like we'll be filling our time with capitalism things alongside other humans. And then we're like, we're doing this together. But actually, you know, <laughs> it's like, you know. We're, it's a Game of Thrones watching party, but like we're all having our own individual experience as in TV. Um, and I mean, I love Game of Thrones. I, I did like, not mean to. Don't cast aspersions in the wrong direction, message. The point that I'm trying to make, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that our inclination is to really just be in relationship to give each other like the most quality, best attention that we can give each other. Um, and it's been really amazing to spend the last few months of my life just like under that attention and giving that attention. Um, and it's, it's helped me notice how like not inclined I am towards mm. um, so many of the other activities of consumption. That's mm. great. I also fell in love this year and I feel like one of the ways I've been divesting is I'm not sharing it very much. I'm not performing it for anyone else. Mm. Um, it's not something I want to present or put on a show about. It's just mine. It's just ours. And it's very nourishing. Um, I also am divesting from capitalism by giving a, away most of what I earn in my life. Um, and I, I think it's really important to be in a practice. I, I think this is what has kept me sane through the process of organizing and movement work has been not being in a practice of like, what is everyone else making that is like near my level? Um, and like, I need to be getting that, mm. but what do I need? And that that's what I need. And then how do I move the rest <coughs> of the resources into some collective space? And this past two years of experimentation for emergent strategy has been from that, the money that was like, I didn't need, but I was able to receive, if that makes sense. Like people are like, we wanna pay you this for this because that's what people pay for this. And I'm like, well, I only need this. Okay, well, we're still gonna pay you this. It's amazing what happens in our movement space where all of a sudden it's like, oh, I need 80,000, 100,000, 120,000. It just keeps going up mm -hmm. because someone's making that much. And then we suddenly find ourselves spending that much because mm -hmm. we have that much. And suddenly you're caught up in this level that you don't think of as wealth, but anywhere else you might travel to, people would be like, Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I think about that, like, take what you need, but the rest should all be going to movement, to justice, to liberation work, to things you believe in, to children who need it. How do you redistribute personally? Um, I think a lot of people are not thinking about redistribution personally because you think you have to be wealthy to redistribute personally. 
And I think that's the opposite. It's more like, oh, the more I can redistribute. And I, I'll say last year was such a humbling year because the IRS came for my neck and mm. suddenly I didn't have anything. Um, and I'd been used to having and redistributing. And suddenly what I didn't have, it was amazing to be able to call on people and there were so many people that I had given to who were able to give me something and support me and wanted to be able to support me. And there are so many people that I am in a flow of love and relationship with. Yeah. And it was like, oh, this doesn't have to be capitalism. This doesn't have to be transactional. I can receive this as like a love offering. And now I'm trying to continue giving in that same way. Like when someone asks or someone needs something, how do I not think of what they're asking for as mine? Because um, it's not mine. You know, like nothing is ours except our bodies. I really believe that too. Mm -hmm. Like everything else is temporarily in our holding. Even that is temporarily in our holding. Yes, yeah. but you know, I'm like, that's for my, I hope I hold that the whole time I'm here, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> everything else can come and go, right? And uh, that shift has really helped me be like, oh, when I have something I can give. I also want to say on a, collective or movement level, I, I think that we need to be in this conversation so much more often is like mm -hmm. just being really aware, like having it be a transparent conversation, like learning how to talk about money. Like, what do you have? Here's what I have. What are you doing to divest it? Here's what I'm doing to divest it. What are you doing? Because I think the conversations I often hear, are, what are you doing to invest and accumulate mm -hmm. more and more and more and save and retire and all this? And like with my friends, we're trying to have talks about like, we want to do this together. Like we want to grow old together and be together. Like how do we do that in a collective way? Like how do we not think about just our singular retirement, but like what do we all need to do together to have mm -hmm. land together, to dream that land, you know, not as an obligation to the people that we love, mm -hmm. but as a gift that we will be able to offer someday. Yeah. That there will already be some fruit trees or some, you know, hot tub and a sauna <laughs> on that land. Uh, but like thinking of it collectively, right? And some of us, some of my friends are making a lot right now and some are making very little, but I want us all to equally be able to access what we generate in this life, you know? Mm -hmm. So, because even though work is all valued at different levels, like our, our lives are not, so, yeah. Steal away. Yes. Oh. Steal away. Steal away to Jesus. Steal away. I mean, we need to steal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> say more. If you black, you come from people who stole themselves. Yes. And I invite all of you to pretend like you come from those same people. Mm -hmm. We need to steal <laughs> our shit back yes. from our fucking rip off, violent ass government. <laughs> we done already pay for everything we actually need to live collectively, but our yes. government keeps stealing it from us. Yes. Talk we already about. put in the pot. Yes. Uh, we got really bad systems. And too many of us, you know, give up on this communal health care because you don't uh, like the step forward. Yeah. But um, there are too many banks running the country through social services, and it all comes to a halt because too many of us are not fighting yes. for all of the things that we actually need. So we need to steal. Mm -hmm. And um, regularly, <laughs> as a daily practice. <laughs> Take your shit back <laughs> and don't give it up again. That's right. And watch out for each other. Because some of us can steal yeah. um, through these systems mm -hmm. um, really with ease. Yeah. And then they keep it for themselves. That's right. And you need to steal and then give it to this, the, Robin what she Hood, just said. 
Yeah. And also, if you are an elder and you have an abundance, um, give that shit away. That's right. You know, you've lived your life. Yeah. Um, you got some kids. You got like multiple houses. Do your kids need all those houses? You got art, Aggie guns, sold one painting. Uh, 165 fucking million dollars. And then she funded, she seeded, like a plan with the Ford Foundation to end our horrible practices around incarceration. Right. And she said, this is something I can do before I die. And then she pointed out at like some of her other friends who have some pieces and was like, what you gonna do? Like, <laughs> what you, you know? Gonna do? And even if you don't have like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff, mm. you're getting ready to leave the earth. And if you've lived a long time, <laughs> you know you're getting ready to leave. Yes, prepare. Just start giving it away. Pay some young mm -hmm. activist rent. Like, do anything. <laughs> I, I, know, I get Not yelled at a young. lot when I say it this, but it's true. <laughs> yes. You can't take it with you. Make sure it's gone by the time you go. Yes. That's, That's right. what I'm going to do. If I have anything, I'm going to be giving it away. I started because I've passed the 50 mark. So I started giving things away. I had like 14 guitars. I really play three. That's right. The rest of them are going. You know, whatever you have, um, you should, generations. Yes. Like generations, you should have annoying people at each generation. So if you're 20, you need a 10 year old that's bugging you trying to take everything you have. And then, they, <laughs> and then, you know, when you're 30, you should have 20 and 10, and 40, 30, 20. And they should annoy you and try to change what you're doing. And you yeah. should be like, why are these people yes. here? Yes. And why are they taking all my things? <laughs> and then they don't give you no credit. They just take it and go on about their business. And that's the way it should that's be. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's right. supposed to be. Mm -hmm. that's They're right. stealing from you. <laughs> 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 They're silly from you, but I love it. It's like changing the it. direction of the river, right? Yeah. It's like right now we think the river should all be flowing into our bank accounts, into our accumulation, like into having it all. It's like changing the direction, right? Like yeah. everything we gather, it's like how do we have it flow out? If we all do it, if we all do it, there's so much. There's, there's plenty. There's so much. Anyway, so, yeah. There's absolutely plenty. All right, patiently waiting. Good job just like taking care of your need to sit. That was great. I know, there were so many chairs, that was sweet. <laughs> What is, what is that? Well, I want you to talk about your novel. I don't know. Is that appropriate? <laughs> the novel. <laughs> I can say one thing about this. Yeah. Which is, I, um, I think for the past decade, have thought about writing as something that's like a personal practice, like I need to be in a daily practice of creation. And almost like a rigorous, 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 like I need to hone my craft. And... Um, and I enjoy honing my craft, so it's like a joyful rigor. <laughs> um, my dad is here, so I'll stop there. Um, but I think that part of what is shifting for me, and I'm actually in conversation with a lot of people who have done like different kinds of movement leadership, and they're all engaging in now creative practices, writing fiction, writing poetry, uh, creative memoirs, creative nonfiction. And I think what's shifting is a lot of us are like, we have to be the storytellers. And in a way, we have to, um, it's not that we get less rigorous, but we have to be a more open channel because there are new stories that need to come into the world right now. Mm -hmm. And so we have to get the part of our ego out of the way that's like, this isn't good enough, I can't release it. The part of us that's worried so much about being critiqued that we never let the art come um, or come through or come out. And so I think for me, I've been doing that. I've, I'm sitting on like two novels that I've written that I'm like, they're not Toni Morrison. Not, you know, it's like, no, they're not going to be Toni Morrison novels. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they still have impossibly important 
things that other people need to have access to, and this is how spirit chose to channel them through me. So I need to stop grasping them so tightly with my individualistic, perfectionist vibe and like release them. And even I'm thinking about different ways of community practice of writing and creating together. You know, we've been doing these visionary fiction workshops through Octavia's Brood, and it's just incredible to see what happens when people ideate collectively, right? When they're like, oh, let me think of fiction together. Let's think of the new stories together. So that to me feels like, you know, I'm like, oh, I would love to be in more practices where people are not just in study groups and reading groups, but also creation groups. Where they're like, we need to be creating the next story for our neighborhood, for our community, for our group. Like that it becomes a thing that you do when you get together with people and you're like, we want to do something together. Let's write the story. What is the story of how we're going to be? What are the successes of this story? What are the love stories in this story? The, we, are, we are stories, like humans are stories, walking stories. We are the stories we're telling about our past and the stories we're telling about our future. Mm -hmm. And we just get stuck in such small, narrow loops of stories that are acceptable. And then that's what our lives become. And that's what our collective lives become. And I'm really excited to be a channeler of future collective stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. That's awesome. I can't catch no man <laughs> like hanging out at the discotheque. I believe in the boogie, but the boogie don't believe in me. Well, I got my way of moving, just sitting down here in my seat. I get soul satisfaction without jumping up and moving my feet. Do you know this song? I don't, yeah, but I'm learning yeah, it now. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm writing a disco show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lord. Yeah. With um, that. my great, uh, my friend and musical collaborator, Juliet Jones. Oh, my God. And um, disco That's as a congregational movement that is inclusive of so many things and had to be uh, literally blown up at a baseball field because it was so powerful. Yes. And um, white people got scared of it even as white people participated in it. Right. So I was That's like, so funny. like I can't. if you do, if you like, <laughs> you know, I just started researching and I was like, this is a global phenomena yes. that got people to listen to all kinds of music and all kinds of languages, go to places together and dance, learn dances, um, also got people like, to house huge spaces yes. where people could come together. Yes. And then change the entire music industry where, you know, Kiss had to make a disco song, mm. Rolling Stones had to make a disco song, you know, Rod Stewart had to make a, a disco song. Once it hits Rod Stewart, it, it's you like. You know, it's bananas. And it broke, it broke the lie mm. of who is powerful, a powerful voice in music. And, and then, they destroyed it, and then they built back up right. the castle until um, sound scan happened, huh. which actually made you scan the actual sale of records as opposed to what record companies were shifting. And that that week, like that week that it changed, huh. the top 100 completely changed, and it was like all of these rappers and all of these stuff. And Ross Stewart and them was like down in the 50s where they have always been. <laughs> Except for like, you know, maybe their first iconic eras in the 60s mm -hmm. and early, you know? The iconic phase. Yeah, but they, they lied about everything and yes. lying about who is the dominant voices yes. in art is uh, violence against the people. That's right. And it leads to political unrest. And disco um, mm. transformed and shook that up um, for a period of time, and it literally, disco records got blown up at a doubleheader at a baseball game in wow. Chicago, and there's like, you asked Nile Rogers, and he was like, the next day, yeah. people stopped booking his band. That's right. So I'm doing a disco show, because I'm like, That's you know, amazing. and I'm gonna have an orchestra, <clears throat> and I'm gonna have like dancers, I see and it. then I'm gonna have a silent disco in the lobby before the show yes. starts. Yes. And then you're gonna learn a dance out there that you will do at some point. <laughs> oh my up here. God, that's yeah. so amazing! <laughs> like, and I'm gonna have like DJs. It. I'm gonna have all kinds of things. Yes, I, you know. Maybe, I love you so much. Maybe we'll workshop in here, David. <laughs> <Where are> you, <laughs> David. <laughs> yes. I 
also want to say that Autumn is dressed for the role. She's already kind of I'm like <laughs> for a disco dance or yeah. anything like that. Yeah. We're gonna have a lot exactly. of fun and, and dance and move together and tell the truth. Yes. About who we are and how we exist on this planet. And again, do some stealing. Mm -hmm. So reclaim it. That's what I'm writing. I love that. Yeah. We should do a workshop. I'm, I'm already, I'm like, girl, we, we are doing the workshop already. Right. right. <laughs> yes. So. I just want to know, how deep is your love? Is your love? How deep is your love? I really need to know. Cause we're living in a world of fools. Breaking us down when they all That counts as just, it's like in the era. I mean, it's, it's like on a... In the sort of... I'm auditioning for your show. <laughs> that was, like, uh, have to that wrap was up. such Driver, a beautiful moment. Pull up the audition, <laughs> please. Um, moment. So I know that we've reached time. I want to say <laughs> you're the best ever. You are yeah. the best. I'm a devotee. And we are Toshi. devotees. <laughs> 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 and also, thank y'all so much for really honoring the question part of the Q&A. Like, y'all came through with Excellent questions. Excellent questions. Um, Ask us questions. Thank you so much to Emerson, um, to Mia. Thank you for insisting mm -hmm. upon having us here. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, Akiba. for showing up in the snow. We are so grateful. We can't believe that this continues to be something we get to do and people invite us to do because we're having a blast and it's so great. Thank you, Skin thank Tones. You. Skin oh, Tones. Yes. Y'all were everything. Yes. Yeah. And um, we love y'all. Yeah. See you soon. Good night. Night. Hello.